Well, we'll go ahead uh, and get started. I think uh, Leroy is uh, the first one up with Group A. Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, really impressive to see how many people show up on a Sunday morning for the wrap-up. You know, it's... Uh, I'm always impressed uh, with the dedication of uh, everyone at this meeting every year. This is the fourth year, and and uh, the uh, and hasn't slacked off a bit. So everybody's obviously very passionate about what they do. Uh, well, let's see. I was the um, I was the chair of uh, uh, the discussion group A, and the advertised title was Cooperative International Research Initiatives for ISS and Space Exploration Beyond Earth Orbit. And we had a very nice, uh, very good discussion, very collegial discussion. And uh, we started out kind of framing the problem with uh, asking a question, which was what kind of science and st or what kind of structure and interaction uh, would yield the best science on ISS? And uh, the conclusion that we came out with is that we need some kind of a change in the paradigm, and it's got to be consistent with the transportation model. What I mean is, you know, we, we need to consider the, uh, if we're going to be flying up and down on Soyuz only, if they were, we're expecting a, a commercial vehicle to be available in the next few years, uh, you know, those kinds of issues. Is shuttle going to be uh, extended out a little bit or not? Uh, things like that. But, you know, there was pointed out, though, the paradigm shift is going to be difficult because of the existing uh, IGAs and MOUs. Uh, but, of course, those are all things that can be negotiated if the leaders of, uh, of the different countries and representatives are amenable to the change. Uh, this fits into, like, an overall strategic plan, uh, particularly to look at how we're going to divvy up crew, things like uh, crew resources, which, are, as, as you know, are pretty much in critical uh, supply or limiting factor oftentimes. We talked about the need for, you know, along those lines, the need for some some kind of a, oh, still on. We talked about the need for some kind of a, a new governing body, and um, really what that what that kind of plays into is that it was pointed out that there is no other laboratory on the ground which uh, uh, is kind of fraction fractionated. You know, there's no coordinated strategic plan on what kind of research is going on at that lab. And one of the examples that was thrown out was in higher energy physics with uh, the super collider and how there's, you know, a coordinated international body that kind of looks over what kind of science is going to be done there. Uh, we felt that something like that would be appropriate for the, uh, uh, for the ISS. Uh, we would want, of course, you know, one of the benefits of that would be that we'd be able to synchronize experiments with... Uh, uh, different things that are going on, the experiments, the corresponding experiments on the ground. And, of course, as I said before, uh, all the leaders of the interested parties have to agree that this is something that they want to create and want to participate and want to give it some teeth. Um, let's see. So the, uh, the idea would be that the, uh, this new governing body would have a, you know, a peer-reviewed uh, uh, peer-reviewed science review to look at proposals and decide what science is going to be there, decide what would be the major thrusts, you know, what areas of research would be important, and prioritize basically what kind of things would go on uh, inside of the, uh, uh, the ISS. It was also pointed out that uh, we'd have to weave in, there's some difficulties, of course, and we'd have to weave in the national labs and the different countries and their, their national lab piece and how that would work. Uh, commercial could be a wild card. Is there going to be any kind of commercial research going on, and how would that play into this, this governing body? So, uh, you know, we talked about a lot of uh, issues uh, it was pointed out that Space Lab, you know, my first mission was a Space Lab, an international Space Lab mission, and flew with Chiaki and Don Thomas here. And uh, it really was kind of worked that way. There was a, a working international working group, and uh, Chiaki brought up the point that the uh, existing IS, I, ISLS, uh, International Space Life Sciences Working Group, uh, needs to fold in the Russians. And maybe that's the beginning of this governing body, because that's the critical piece that's missing, is, that, is uh, there was, there's no Russian participation today. Um, Let's see. Oh, another issue that came up, uh, which is near and dear to all of us, is uh, ITAR, 
restrictions and the effect that has on, on work that's done. And uh, there was a proposal that, uh, you know, or a question asked, could, could it, the ISS become kind of like a, uh, a free zone? You know, could, we, could it be possible to make like an uh, analogy to like a trade, you know, free trade zone, making an ITAR free zone? Uh, nice idea. Um, I'm not sure what percentage chance I'd give it of succeeding. But uh, that, that's a thought. And, you know, of course, a lot of the, the basic research and a lot of life science falls under that would not be, is, you know, currently is not a problem with ITAR. Or maybe uh, nobody's just bothered. To, to go after uh, any of us yet. <laughs> um, let's see, I think I've covered most of it here. Yeah, so then basically that, that was it. You know, we, we wanted to talk about how best to utilize ISS uh, and how to coordinate the science and uh, the idea of this governing body, creating this governing body, maybe something that evolves out of the ISLS working group uh, and brought up these various issues of uh, what would be important to be addressed by this governing body. And, of course, the, the most important part would be that it would be an international, a balanced international partnership, including all of the, all of the partners. Uh, any questions? Okay, thank you. Let's see, maybe we need a little more coffee. Some sort of stimulus going on in Group B. All right, well, shall we move on to Group B then? And Chris, uh, thanks, Leroy, for giving me uh, lots of extra time. I might need it. So, <laughs> anyways, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's been a wonderful few days. Uh, my name is Christian Otto, and I had the pleasure of leading a discussion group B. I just wonder if we could put the first slide up. Maybe I just need to advance the. So. Um, <laughs> And our discussion group was on international integrated uh, analogs, ground-based, and space collaborative research projects. And it was really about leveraging collaborations internationally. But um, it's my great pleasure today to actually tell you about some success that was a direct result of the International Space Medicine Summit in 2009. Um, so building international space medicine collaborative legacy. And I think that's one of the greatest legacies of this group in this meeting is is what it uh, gives rise to. So last year at this meeting on May 17th, um, we had a working group on ground-based analogs led by Lauren Levitin, and many of the members of who was in this year's group were present. And we had three tactical recommendations, and one was to convene an annual international analog workshop, and do we need to establish an international analog uh, network. Well, Lauren Leventon and uh, Oliver Anger from ESA actually took it upon themselves and had a number of others join them, and they actually organized an international workshop that took place uh, December 2009 uh, at ESA, and they called for papers and had a number of distinguished uh, presenters. As I mentioned, it was held on December 7th to the 8th, and at the European Space Research and Technology Center in the Netherlands. Um, it was held adjacent to Isselwig meeting, so it was convenient for individuals. And that's the International Space Life Sciences uh, Working Group. And this is the STEC Center where, where it was held and where Isselwig was held. And so there were several goals of the workshop to gather and summarize uh, information on analogs to formulate research priorities and to evaluate environments and simulations. It was two days. There were agency presentations, uh, scientific presentations based on abstracts, and uh, there were 60 participants from the U.S., Russia, Japan, and Europe. And so the workshop recommendations were to conduct a series of studies with a structured approach addressing and defining questions, selecting analogs according to research questions, utilization of ISS for increments longer than six months, and we had a very uh, lively discussion on that earlier in the program, uh, require more integration and multi multidisciplinarity in research approaches, uh, develop an approach for international collaboration on analog 
simulation activities, which we've, our group certainly discussed uh, yesterday, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment, and develop an approach, um, sorry, exchanges like this. This was one of the summary recommendations was that exchange, and this is right from uh, Oliver's report, exchanges like at this workshop would be, uh, should be repeated and an overall strategy developed. So essentially people felt it was a very useful exercise to bring all of these experts together. So I just thought I'd, it'd be worth sharing that with you to see what actually came of this meeting. So, so moving on to uh, discussion group B, and we had a number of participants and we, we had a good launching point from last year, so we had a number of assumptions, and, and I only have a couple more slides, and I'm going to get to what, what we spoke about. But space analogs provide the venue for translational research, transitioning the research for operationally relevant deliverables and products for exploration missions. And uh, we presented these as we kicked off yesterday's meeting to, to provide a launching point. And these analogs fill a critical gap in keeping humans healthy, safe, and productive in spaceflight, and they're a necessary component in our space exploration strategy for reasons uh, that we'll talk about. We need to be more systematic and integrative in how we utilize the various analogs uh, in reducing the risk for human space exploration. That's one of their great advantages, and there are certainly cost savings as well. An international collaboration is an opportunity to be both more systematic and more integrative, and I think we've heard that all through uh, this meeting. Okay, so just quickly, we, we just talked about a few analogs, but our, our, and analogs are key to space medicine research, and the tasks that we were given, uh, you know, radiation protection, these are just some of the ideas, medical support, behavior and human performance, partial G, micro G, EVA requirements, suits and rovers, system support, uh, NIH, various NASA collaborations, research technology support, and education and outreach. So this is sort of the framework in which the discussion uh, took place. And technology transfer is an issue, certainly, in analogs to space flight. But there's also a bit of a circular pattern because that also feeds back to improving life on Earth. But from this meeting, there were other very important topics that I think we wanted to move ahead from that aspect, which we talked about quite a bit last year, and really talk about international collaboration. There was a number of points that came up. Single point peer review, which is an issue with multiple agencies and analogs. Funding. If... Um, the Russians, Vadim Gushin, wants to do research on NEMO. How, how can he conduct that? How can he do that? If we want to do research on IBMP, uh, how can we do so? Agency, is it an agency management priority, analogs? I think we answered that question yesterday. Um, how do you maintain competition? Uh, relevant mission research questions. That's important. We talk about risks. What about multidisciplinarity involving the engineering community in some of our uh, research ideas? common protocols amongst researchers. These are all ideas that we discussed yesterday. Formatting of common risks would be important. And what about worldwide um, analog resourcing? So just a few comments before we talk about um, the really interesting discussion that we had yesterday. Um, uh, we had a great uh, evening talk yesterday from Charlie Bolden, and I think we all know that NASA has re recently been given a new mission, which is to focus on long-duration exploration with an eventual mission to Mars. So I think we do have a, a goal post. Um, the current Mars reference mission, though, is on the order of 30 months in duration, and I'm not sure that we have a true sense for the gravity of a mission of that length. And my experience in long-duration missions with two one-year tours at remote Antarctic research stations, an additional two years spent on high mountains and skiing across stretches of the high Arctic, has really shown me how difficult prolonged isolation and confinement uh, can be. And if, Leroy, if you don't mind if I borrow a comment from, from you yesterday in the international panel yesterday, uh, Leroy left us with what I thought were some sage comments regarding his transition from shuttle missions to his ISS uh, increment, and he said to us, it was like night and day. I just want to repeat that. It was like night and day, the difference between his two-week shuttle mission and his six and a half months aboard uh, the ISS. 
And I just want to say, and I've been saying this for a while, that the same is true in transitioning from six months to a year. And my experience tells me that it'll be a similar uh, giant leap in difficulty when we transition from uh, one year to two years and longer. So um, I think analogs are a great opportunity to investigate the difficult issues associated with that. So please don't be mistaken. I think the difficulties associated with missions exceeding a year and longer uh, in duration are going to be significant. Um, and to that end, uh, to date only four cosmonauts have flown a year or longer continuously in space. So our, our uh, experience is actually quite limited. And although there's a lot of experience from the Antarctic for uh, up to a year in isolation, we actually have I think four to 5,000 winter overs who wintered at U.S. Antarctic stations. So we do have a lot of experience up to one year. But the only other modern long-duration model of isolation and confinement is uh, Biosphere 2, which is based in Arizona and Tucson. And I just mentioned that because last week, um, week before last at ASMA, I actually had the opportunity to go down and visit Biosphere, and I've been very interested in that for a long time because I think it's an important data point because it's a two-year mission. And I actually had dinner with two of the eight crew members uh, who spent two years inside uh, a three-and-a-half-acre isolation chamber, and inside they had 3,800 species of plants and animals, um, seven different biomes, including an ocean, tropical rainforest, and savanna, and yet, despite all that sensory stimulation, they, stuff, they suffered greatly. Um, a number of them developed depression. One even developed PTSD. And all of them required prolonged periods of uh, recovery, some of them several years. And so for me, Biosphere 2 really underscored just how profound the effects of social monotony are in isolation on mission success and crew health. And we haven't even talked about sensory deprivation, which they didn't suffer. And we're going to be adding both of those issues uh, to long-duration space flight. And in that vein, I think the Mars 520-day study, which we heard quite a bit about, uh, I think, personally, I think it'll be a landmark experiment, but uh, I'm not certain we're going to like the results uh, from the 520-day study, but uh, I suspect they will be a further awakening to the difficulties of prolonged isolation and confinement. Anyways, moving along, uh, I think it's precisely uh, these analogs that will be key in helping us solve the difficult problems of long-duration spaceflight. And I think in the past few days, we've been treated to some of the remarkable attributes of analogs. Um, Chris Hadfield, the commander of NEMO 14, he joined us from the undersea habitat uh, below the waters off of Key Largo to share with us, you know, the mission operational fidelity uh, of NEMO. And uh, thanks to our, our Russian colleagues, uh, we were treated to a video tour of the Mars 520-day uh, complex and study, which I think will push the limits of prolonged isolation and confinement and sensory deprivation uh, for uh, a mission crew. So it was in that context that our, our group undertook the job of examining international integrated analog ground-based space and collaborative research. And we had 32 members in our group um, representing all areas, and I'd like to thank all the members of the group uh, for being so patient and cordial. It was a, it was a great group. You made my uh, task of facilitating quite easy. And I'd like to thank each member of our distinguished group for your valuable contributions to the discussion, and I'll attempt to report that to you now. And I think we went through the assumptions that we based that on and the discussion topics and so on. So we, I broke this down. First off, general comments. Um, I think we felt that some analogs have incredible fidelity with respect to mission operation scenarios like NEMO. Um, some analogs are valuable real estate uh, in that their environment has high fidelity to many aspects of spaceflight. Again, I'll point out the Mars 520 day study. And again, excuse me, a similar issue came up this year that you can really define, divide analogs into two groups. There's an operational analog. So to test mission scenarios, perhaps equipment, etc. But there's also experimental analogs. So analogs such as bed rest, where we can define the parameters a little more closely. <coughs> Radiation labs, particle accelerators. Um, uh, Charles O'Man mentioned parabolic flight. And so analogs 
can support uh, bo also both low and high CRL science projects. That was noted. Um, in terms of fidelity, some are higher fidelity space operations because they have astronaut participants. Some don't. So particularly when we're doing BHP research, sometimes we may want to consider who are the uh, operators. Training is part of the operational analogs, so training crews, uh, training medical procedures, uh, training for ground operations. Um, an important element that was expressed by the group was the notion that there's a process in the maturation of the research product or deliverable that begins in the experimental lab environment. It may begin in the experimental lab environment and then may move through actually different analog uh, settings with different characteristics and fidelity that serve to test and validate the technology, the tool, the protocol, or what have you. So you can actually have a series of analogs to test a tool or technology to mature and then eventually test it on ISS, which is, is for all intents and purposes, uh, also an analog to long-duration flight. So those are some of the general comments. In terms of uh, specific comments regarding international collaboration, we generated, I think, more questions than answers, and, and this leads to our conclusions. Um, but there are many barriers to collaboration. I think everyone agreed on that, and, and that's, I think, reflective of where we're starting. We're trying to build something, so um, you, you come upon barriers initially. So what if one entity or agency has the ability to pull the plug? That was certainly a concern. I think given our lunchtime discussion, it's about trust and communication and fairness and, and so on. Uh, we need to define the showstoppers to international collaboration, so we have to understand what the barriers are first before we can overcome them. Does management agree that analogs are important? Um, amongst the managers in the group, the consensus was yes, so we're all happy to hear that. Uh, there were many concerns around funding. Uh, one aspect that came up was who owns the facility, which was an issue. So, for example, um, NASA doesn't own NEMO, but it's seen as a, a NASA analog. Uh, the Mars 500-day study, IBMP, um, and there are others. And the question was, does it always matter? I think those are issues that we can work around because we have common interests in analogs. And, you know, there's a lot of camaraderie in that group, and we just need to extend that to this uh, international forum. Uh, it was pointed out that access can often equate to, to money and who manages the facility. Uh, there was a concern, what about funding for internationals? So if NASA wanted to do a study uh, in the Mars 520-day uh, project, uh, how would that be funded? Would NASA come with the funding? Would they be able to apply for funds uh, provided through IBMP? And I think those are issues that need to be worked out. There was a thought that funding should be set aside to help fund international research analogs, perhaps having a pool that everyone contributes to. That was another idea. Uh, there was acknowledgement that there were uh, other barriers also exist besides just funding. So what about IRB approval? Um, if you have IRB approval from an American institution, will that be recognized by the IBMP and vice versa? Um, there was a suggestion that perhaps there be an international IRB forum, and there may be other mechanisms that exist that we can take advantage of as well. Often today's uh, analogs have a primary goal, and then they pile on other objectives. So, you know, if you're running an experiment uh, in an analog and two or three other investigators come along and they have a similar experiment, does that, uh, and we heard examples of that during our discussion, does that uh, affect the results? Again, having a collaborative forum like this hopefully would uh, ameliorate some of those issues. Okay, so moving on to interna more ideas surrounding international analog users forum. So we're, we're getting to more of the nuts and bolts here. Uh, it was suggested... Um, that we have an international user forum. I think everyone agreed on that. And just one more slide, they suggested modeling a concept. These are our group members here. Thanks to everyone, we had 32 group members. And I don't want to belabor this. This is just a schematic in there. BHP has one as well in terms of how we might uh, lay out all these ideas to use analogs. But just to point out, we have various Pointer's not working. We have various stakeholders. Oops. Various stakeholders. Um, you have various individual objectives. 
you have analog capabilities, you'll run various missions, and you'll generate reports. Uh, don't focus on the details here, but the forum would develop a framework to utilize all of these uh, analogs. Oh, thanks very much. Thanks. So the purpose of the a user panel would be to take research objectives uh, from everyone, create an integrated protocol, and then match them up with the appropriate analogs. I mean, it makes sense. Um, and it follows that uh, sweeping up available funding would also happen, hopefully, I think the group had expressed. Uh, the peer review process should be international, but funding uh, should also be international. That was expressed. I think there are many ways around funding, and I'll, we'll sum up with uh, final thoughts on that, which uh, I think makes sense. Everyone would contribute to a common fund. We mentioned that peer-to-peer -peer, uh, peer review would take place by an international team. Uh, first issue to integrate the protocol so that the science objectives are not redundant. We kind of discussed that, but that would be an important role for the forum. Uh, the opportunity uh, and value to piggyback technology assessments on these missions, that was expressed. Again, I think that speaks to mul multidisciplinarity. It's important to consider private sector support to analog sites. Uh, that might help maintain the infrastructure, uh, and agencies would be uh, more on a by the time model that was expressed. Uh, we need to define the strategic endpoints for analog research, and I think that was a point that was clearly expressed, and I think the group felt that we need to address these issues at the risk level, so the spaceflight risk level. Um, and there were a number of models that were expressed that this group could be based on. For example, uh, uh, Amy Cronenberg mentioned the Particle Accelerator <coughs> Research Panel, uh, could serve as a collaborative model. And also, it was mentioned that the bed rest campaign would be another uh, good model where there are multiple researchers coming in with protocols accessing uh, a research campaign. We need to develop a strategic plan for milestones for international collaboration and then have people work the plan. We need to be careful to distinguish between facilities which can support analog missions versus just the mission itself. So what, uh, what work needs to be done? So this is where the heavy lifting comes in, and then uh, we'll sum up with our conclusions. We need to define the criteria, criteria that each analog represents and their individual ratings on each characteristic. And uh, BHP, the BHP element at NASA has done a lot of work in that regard, and I think you've heard some of the results at the NASA HRP meeting and at ASMA where we've started to do that work in defining the characteristics for each analog and rating them so that essentially creating a catalog of the analog. So if you're a particular researcher and you wanted various aspects, which analog should I go to? Um, so matching up research needs with analog capabilities. We need to categorize various analogs. Actually, we have, actually we have you know, as I mentioned, operational versus experimental and so on. A clear point that was expressed at the beginning of the conversation was what's the baseline reference mission? What are we referencing the analog to? And initially, BHP was using a six-month lunar long scenario, and I think we're all, I assume, aiming towards a, a Mars reference mission now, so a long-duration mission. I think that uh, was clearly expressed, and, and that's what we're shooting for. Uh, what are the end products from each analog? Uh, for example, characteristics, how are they influenced by the specific <coughs> characteristics of each analog? Uh, we need to understand the problems of international integration on this forum. We need to define the barriers to success. Um, we need different objectives for each research area. So radiation has objectives, uh, MedOps has objectives, um, BHP has certain objectives. So. Uh, I could see this forum having subgroups and involving those particular experts so that they could express their needs for these analogs. We need to establish an international peer review process for this framework, agree on scientific allocation uh, between the agencies. The weight of the project should be, so projects that are submitted, uh, the weight of these projects should be based on what's the spaceflight risk that they address, what's their scientific merit, and also, what's the overall desire for the analog? So if everyone wants to come to NEMO, um, obviously some decisions need to be made in, in uh, 
competitive selection of these papers. Uh, funding has two sides, one for national, uh, the national agency looking after an analog or who represents the analog, and also funding of the scientific project. And those are not necessarily mutually exclusive, and they don't necessarily, it's not, there's no reason why they can't be separate as well. So the conclusions in, uh, were that International Analog Users Forum would be an advantageous tool to facilitate international collaboration uh, in pooling analog sites, uh, expertise and funds in addressing research questions important to supporting human spaceflight and maintaining crew, health, and long-duration spaceflight. Uh, in regards to the research strategy, we need to start at the risk level and use the risk to drive the analog research questions. And we want defined deliverables. We want to use these analogs uh, strategically to answer the important questions to solve the problems of long-duration spaceflight. And we want to, I think it's important to put research, we can put research into an obligated analysis pathway. So for example, an analog stream, as, as I mentioned earlier, such that they'd progress through a number of analogs and either fail or mature. Um, the successful tools and technologies, or uh, CONOPS, Concept of Operations, then could be deployed to ISS as a final analog testing ground before incorporation into long-duration space flight. So we felt there were three steps in this process, was we need to define the stakeholders, and these are some of the things we'll do over the coming months, and uh, I'll, I'll finish with our steps moving forward. So define the stakeholders, uh, the group to support collective analog research, who are those people? Assemble the analog representatives, analog experts, uh, collaborative facilities who may fund these projects, agency representatives. Put all the objectives on the table uh, regarding use, research, uh, and so on. Try and come to a consensus, and then match the objectives to the specific, specific analogs, and uh, that gives us the power of speaking with one voice. And that leads naturally to the third aspect. When we can speak powerfully uh, with one voice, then we can go out and get funding. Um, and I think agencies uh, will see the validity uh, as the process serves to solve designated risks, uh, space flight, and it's based on uh, consensus. So how are we going to accomplish this? Um, so we'd like to leverage this meeting and combine the, the good ideas from last year with uh, what we discussed this year distribute that to the participants in our group, and I think we'd be happy to distribute it to anyone else at the meeting if you have an interest. And then over the next five months, we'd like to refine the ideas to develop a user's panel's agenda. So, and convene a workshop uh, in less than one year from today, uh, in April or May of 2011, uh, mirroring the December 2009 workshop put together by uh, Oliver Anger and Lauren Levitin and others, uh, but this workshop will include a detailed discussion of agenda items refined over the coming months and working towards the development of an international analogs user forum. Uh, and uh, Dr. John Charles uh, kindly agreed to assist in holding the workshop in conjunction uh, with next year's Human and Space Conference next April, and also uh, Dr. Rupert Gertzer uh, offered to hold the workshop in conjunction with a conference at the DLR next April and May. So there was widespread support uh, for this move, and um, we look for, uh, forward to reporting back to you uh, at this meeting in May 2011. Thanks. I don't know if you have any questions, but sorry I took a little extra time, but uh, hopefully it was worthwhile. Okay. Some questions are... Uh, okay, I, 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 just say, I, I think that uh, Christian did a very good job of summarizing the group's input. It was obviously a diverse community with a lot of different ideas, and trying to get it together into a, a cogent recommendation was difficult. But I think he did a very good job of doing that because I think this is something we've needed for a long time. We have a lot of different individuals trying to do this work at, at single locations and they can't get any synergy between the organizations because of these international barriers. I think this is the first step towards overcoming these barriers and developing uh, protocols uh, that will have mission focus that will solve or at least approach our, our key um, uh, milestones with 
uh, a, a way to uh, to come together with consensus ideas on how to get funding. And funding has been the challenge. We recognize this group can't solve that, but at least we can get the scientific ideas together and get consensus in the international community. We'd probably be much more effective in getting these projects funded. Thanks, Jeff. Couldn't agree more. <clears throat> I also want to say that uh, this workshop, uh, this subgroup made a great job. I think it's good to make it more, let's say, structured, the process, and more well organized. And there must be some criteria for assessment which started appearing a year ago. That's very important. But what is also important, as for me, was also stressed, especially by Igor Savilev, I think uh, this is important to, to create, let's say, a schedule or timeline for the utilization of these analogs. I think they must work on a systematic basis, and the scientific community should know when they can try and observe another hypothesis. So there must be systematic utilization of this basis and the systematic access and systematic calls for proposals, like it is for ESS, for example. So we need, uh, let's say, ESS on Earth as a permanently existing system of analogs working for in-space research. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Uh, Christian, you, you indicated uh, it seemed that most of your presentation was looking forward, things to do downstream. I wonder, uh, has the group spent any time working on looking backward uh, to get into, if you will, kind of mine the lessons learned from other experiences. The example I'm thinking of is you mentioned Biosphere 2 and that some people such suffered depression and PTSD and what have you. Uh, I'm not sure, but that may well be that there are lessons learned there that would uh, begin to identify uh, uh, personal characteristics, behavioral characteristics of individuals that would influence crew selection for long-term missions, for example. Um, has the group spent any time looking backwards to uh, see what can be learned from what, what's happened previously? Well, I think the, the answer is, I mean, there's just so much to discuss in uh, so little time. Um, I don't think we did that formally. I think that there are many experts in the group who have looked at other analogs. I mean, uh, myself in particular, I'm very interested in many of the analogs, Antarctica. Uh, I have looked at Biosphere very closely because I think there, there are uh, methodological issues with it, but I think there are things that we can learn from it. Um, so I think many of the analog experts have done that. I think that's why they have expertise in analogs. Um, I think the group, because they already buy into the analogs and they understand that, we wanted to spend our time moving forward and improving the process because we all love space flight and I think we're all embraced long duration. We, we enjoy tackling the issues of long duration. So, um, But those are things that I think would come up if we had an international forum and those are the sorts of things that did come up the working group because people made presentations, they talked about all analogs, so there was more opportunity for dialogue um, as opposed to the very high-level meeting we had yesterday. And I think this forum would allow for that discussion, why should we use one analog over another based on previous experience, where should we deploy the research surrounding the various risks, and I think that discussion would occur. It didn't happen yesterday, but again, I think we were functioning at a, a higher level to, to get to those lower levels. Oh, sorry, yeah, I don't know why that didn't end up in here because it was a point. I must have skipped over it, but thanks, Jeff. I thought that was that was a key uh, recommendation, um, and I, I did put it in here. I don't know why it didn't come up, but anyways, that we have an area for the forum and for the experts to put the results of 
experiments in analogs. So a common site, whether that's a website um, that is accessible to everyone at large or just the researchers, but it was the idea of collaborating and providing all the research data for the analog community. So that was a, that was the point that came up that everyone, I think, re agreed upon, and those are things we would discuss uh, at this meeting in the future. Th thank you for uh, excellent... Uh Excellent summary. Uh, I agree with you that there's going to be a lot of unanticipated problems. We can't think of everything in advance before you are on your way out to Mars, if you will. But I also think that you can't fully anticipate the ability of highly motivated crew to adjust, to solve, and you know, resolve problems on board. Uh, I just think that I'll go into the thinking. That don't don't give up just because. Uh, the problem looks really big. I have great faith in the crew's to, uh, ability to accommodate. Yeah, Mr. Cunningham, I couldn't agree with you more because, you know, my two years uh, in Antarctica at a remote research station as a station physician, we function autonomously, and we encountered a number of very difficult problems, and it was the skill of the crew and the individuals who came together to solve that problem. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, uh, you know, it's the ingenuity of, of mankind and, and people working together um, that will uh, accomplish these difficult and historic tasks. Uh, I just think that if we can set the best conditions for them, um, uh, that, that will be beneficial. But I agree with you 110%. The comment yesterday that really resonated with me in this panel was an analog to what? And that's really haunted me, I guess, over the last few hours. And uh, it's a twofold question. First is, where are we going? What, where is the mission to and, you know, when? But also, secondly, who's coming with us? You know, everybody in that room representing different international uh, partners and different international interests has an idea of where this is we're going and who's who's all going to be involved and I think it would help if at a higher level our agencies were on the same page about this is what we're doing and this is who's coming and you know here are some parameters that we need analogs to answer questions for because some of these analogs you know quite frankly have been just dragged along year to year out of the sheer force of personality of a person or people who have a deep sense that this analog has something that can offer us in answering these questions, but you know, not necessarily anybody willing to come fund it and say, here are the questions to start answering. And so, you know, you're right that, or I agree with the conclusions we came to yesterday that a way of putting together the requirements and, figure, and figuring out which analog best answers the questions is an end result, but the first thing we got to have is some clarity on what it is we're trying to answer because all of these analogs have a place in answering the questions of going out far away from the Earth and doing these grand space missions, but I think each of us has these different assumptions on what that means and who would be included. and. And so some clarity there would definitely help sharpen the focus on how to use these analogs most effectively. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I think that was, that was expressed by the group. And again, I, just, I think it will be very synergistic if we can bring all these experts together in a forum because there's so many people doing excellent work. And to bring those folks together, uh, we're only, there's going to be a multiplication effect. And I look at the work that, you know, uh, Lauren Levitin's group is doing, uh, Catherine Keaton is leading the, uh, actually grading these analogs and, and creating a ver essentially a catalog, which I think would be very effective. We don't have all the analogs, but if we could expand that, um, and again, you're right, we need to know what we're baselining uh, uh, our research and risks to, and I think that will become apparent. Dave? Yeah, Christian, I've got a number of comments. And uh, first of all, in talking about the analogs, I think it's worthwhile just clarifying for everybody the contribution that analogs have made over the last 10 years. 
The uh, Pavilion Lake Analog Research Site was voted as number eight in the top ten astrobiology research sites globally two years ago. We've had multiple people get PhDs based on research done at Pavilion Lake, and as an analog, it stands its validity in terms of astrobiology research as opposed to human physiology and what we're doing in space exploration. But over the last couple of years, we've added the Deep Worker 2000 sub to that environment. Devon Island has been used for over a decade very successfully. What I would love to see from Devon Island is what I challenged us to see from the results of the space shuttle program, some publications of the scientific results accumulated in Devon Island. NEMO's been going on for nine years, and you've heard some of the exciting work that takes place in NEMO. In addition to that, though, NASA has sent astronauts to the Antarctic as part of the ANSMET program, and we've also had astronauts at Linkankaber at a high-altitude lake, again doing astrobiology research. All of these have value, and I think the operational benefits come from the different analog sites. So there's merit to doing what we've just heard, getting together and talking about this. My caution, though, is with regard to your number one item, which is peer review. And I will never sit there and say, don't do peer review. However, my caution is, in the beginning of all of these analog programs, in particular the, the Canadian Analog Research Network, which is Axel Heiberg, Devon Island, Pavilion Lake, the peer review process was such that the funding community did not value analogs relative to the other types of scientific activities that we could do. So the funding priorities for analogs was perceived to be much lower down. And the reason why a lot of these analogs success, uh, continued successfully was because we took operational funding and had operational objectives. So I would never say don't do peer review. My comment, though, is that there will always be a need for what I would call operationally focused review and operational feasibility review which is a little bit different than peer review to determine quality of science and whether or not funding should be allocated. So in many cases, some of the experiments that have gone on NEMO missions, for instance, we had an experiment involving Cisco and commercially provided hardware. The review of that experiment was not to determine whether funding would or would not be allocated. It was to determine whether or not the project was feasible in the environment that we were working in and whether it would accomplish the scientific objective that we were stating. And I think it's very important to look at it this way because otherwise, if you look at funding analogs in a peer-reviewed merit system, System based on other types of life science research, traditionally, historically, they've not done very well at all. Yeah, thanks for those comments, Dave. Um, very important, and I sh should have clarified, I think, what we meant by peer review, and I'd be happy to have any of the group members uh, correct me, but my sense is when we were discussing peer review, it was exactly as you said, it was above sort of that pure scientific peer review. We obviously want scientific peer review, but it was sort of at an analogs level, and um, it being so, for example, if you had four experiments on a reaction time that you wanted to run, say, for example, at NEMO, that uh, uh, analogs peer review process would select, you know, the one or two best experiments such that, you know, crews weren't overburdened and there wasn't redundancy and confounding of results. Just a quick comment on that one as well. You know, we've heard a lot about this. I think, and I'm not sure if Dave Dinges is still here, but my impression of NEMO is we do this actually very well. And all of the analog processes at NEMO, uh, for NEMO and Pavilion Lake, they use an FRR process. They make sure that there's no redundancy in data collection and that the mission managers do an incredible job just like we would for a space flight. So we're actually doing a pretty good job at that. We can certainly be better, but uh, I wouldn't say that that's a problem. What I would think is, where we need to focus is looking at the utilization of analogs and making sure that we apply the same rigor to all analog environments that we would apply to preparing hardware and crews for a space flight. Yeah, no, and again, I agree with you, and, and maybe I should uh, pick on another uh, analog. I think NEMO is well run, but I'm not sure all the analogs have experienced the same degree of success as NEMO. And just one other point you made about... Uh, uh, providing a, a repository or making available the results of analogs. One point I didn't make about the workshop in the Netherlands was that uh, the, all of the abstracts presented uh, were collated and are going to be published. So I think we'd hope to do that for the future uh, workshop that we hope to hold in a year. Okay, well, thanks so much for your attention. I appreciate the time. Thanks.
Dr. Thompson and Curry for City, education needs and opportunities for original design. Good morning, everyone. Uh, group C, uh, the educational needs and opportunities groups uh, focusing on ISS. We were uh, began our discussion. There were 22 of us uh, at the beginning. There was a, we, we grew to 25 to 26. Then we came down to 22. But everyone stayed in their seat for almost uh, an hour and 45 minutes and uh, added to the discussion. We uh, my. Uh, Barbara Morgan could not be here. She was uh, kind enough to facilitate our activity. Barbara is the, uh, the the perfect educator. As most of you know, she was an elementary school teacher for about 22 years. Uh, she was in the uh, astronaut corps for 14 years. She had an opportunity to, to fly, being part of the teacher in space program, and now she's a university professor in Montana, or Idaho, excuse me, in, uh, in Idaho, uh, teaching young people to be better educators and preparing the next generation of educators for uh, for all of us. Uh, we elected to use a, a process, uh, by the way, the group was made up of scientists, administrators, astronauts, writers, and uh, and so we had a, a nice mix of individuals, both at the, uh, the, the postgraduate level, including we had a physician a, uh, in the group, and we had an opportunity of uh, sharing with one another. From, okay. We elected to use a process called the nominal group process, and for those of you who have used the process, I apologize for explaining it to those of you who may not be aware of it, because none of the 22 people in the room had but were really familiar with what it is. It's a uh, group decision-making process that has uh, uh, essentially one focal point, the moderator, in that case it was me, and uh, it, it controls for uh, external uh, extraneous variants. In other words, what we did was we identified a question that we were going to address, and I'll give you the question in a second, and then everybody wrote down their top three items on those questions, and, from, and then we went around the room and we discussed each of the items as we generated them. So I'll explain to you essentially how this works. Um, we developed a question, and we all agreed upon the question. It was utilizing ISS to engage and to enhance our collective missions. And, and we asked that question, in, in what ways can we do that to improve K-16 education? That was one silo and then gr uh, graduate, postdoc, and professional education on the, another silo. And we generated 46 items, and we discussed 46 items, of which I'm not going to discuss 46 items with you right now because it would, it would take too long, but we, they do cluster into certain groups on certain areas of emphasis. And let me share those with you, if I might. Um, a number of items focused on uh, the uh, creating a br using ISS. By the way, it's a uh, Charlie. I know that all of you have responsibilities as administrators of your respective agencies. Everyone is expected to be part of the solution to the educational problem, both in the U.S. and worldwide. But Charlie, nobody else has ISS, and you do, and we're not using it to its maximum. And we certainly are aware of the the power that this uh, uh, international uh, tool has for all of us. So it's uh, uh, so we thought about this, and when we came up with these ideas, in what ways can we use ISS to uh, create new opportunities for education? And so we, we we actually thought about first, in what ways could we use ISS? to advance the use of this tool. Everybody, regardless of social economic group, 85% of the country has one of these. And so it's a, uh, and uh, some of them get to use it at, uh, as an iPhone. There's 100,000 applications for this iPhone that you can download. You, even those of us who are technologically challenged could build an iPhone app probably within two hours using the software that's available. And probably have it approved within three days and available at the, I, 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 uh, the, uh, the application store. So people thought, well, maybe we should start thinking about using the, uh, the iPhones, but also maybe using text-based uh, 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 ideas for mobiles. And people, for, for example, you can use a text base. You can push text information to individuals, uh, 
And if you are working with correct partnerships, you can do, you have to send it to them for free and ask them to hey, follow this message. Do you have heart disease in your family? Yes, I do. Punch one, two, three. One, two, three, and, and you end up with a connection to a, uh, a website that you can go to for additional information, or you will be automatically mailed information from the agency that's using the, the, this type of application. Pretty simple technology, and it's, uh, it's available now. So it could be used in an educational activity. Um, so we're creating, so that led us to the idea of creating web based resources that are vetted that could be used by educators across the educational continuum. So at the postgraduate and graduate level, we could have web vetted. That means there would be an editorial panel of individuals coming together and deciding what was going to be placed on that website that would be most important for graduate and postgraduate students to have access to, that would be most important for researchers to have access to, most important for uh, uh, physicians to have access to, and then continuing downstream. In other words, it would be organized in ways that would be most useful for people. It, if any of you have tried to find information that is but cataloged by NASA over the, this long, rich history, it's almost impossible to find. It's, many of it is not meta-tagged, it's not searchable, and it's, it's, it, it becomes cumbersome. And after you put in space life sciences and biology and pick up four million hits, and if it doesn't appear on the first page, you kind of get bored and you don't want to go to page two and page three and page four and then search for it. And oftentimes the links are dead when you click on them anyway. So a vetted educational resource, web-based resource, utilizing web 2.0 technologies would make sense for everyone across the educational continuum, and it could be international. The, ed the editorial board could be international and should be international. So. That was one of the ideas that came forward. Another idea that came forward in this theme of broadening our overall reach was the development of or the vitalization of existing programs such as uh, uh, internships and faculty exchange programs and student exchange programs and Moscow State University and the, uh, the, the, the uh, or so some of your German universities have exchange programs where students and faculty members are able to spend summers in, the, in one another's laboratories. And so that was a, an idea and something we don't do very much in the U.S., but we, we possibly should. And then we should... Uh, uh, the, then we should also figure out better ways of sharing the excitement and the vision of ISS. And what we don't do very well as educators, and what you scientists do very poorly is advertise and market what it is that you do do. And so we probably need to figure out better ways of communicating the, our contributions and our, the opportunities for us to make differences to broader audiences. And one of the ideas that came up for that is those of us who were raised in the U.S. Uh, remember a Saturday morning television program uh, called Mr. Wizard. And so the idea came up, why well, not have Saturday morning science on ISS that could be televised in various languages across the world or could be done in webcast, but that would be downloadable into some sort of a server anywhere in the world or multiple servers in the world and broadcast to, to, to faculty members and to children worldwide. And also the combination, came, uh, the idea came up, well, that's all well and good, but we got what we need to collectively work hard on translating the techno talk that we use in uh, the, the, in our work, uh, so the stakeholders that pay attention about us, taxpayers, and uh, and uh, uh, legislators, and uh, the general public in ways that they can understand what it is that we do. So it's a, uh, and the combination said if we're going to translate that, we need people who actually work with these audiences to provide the correct translations. Did you uh, think about how you would provide Saturday morning science? Well, it's, you know, it, uh, some of it could be uh, uh, both, uh, uh, could be synchronous and asynchronous. You could actually actually have some of it can before you get it, and, and you could broadcast it from broadcasting channels, but also you could have maybe the astronauts uh, uh, be, become facilitators. Uh, yeah, well, we've already had, we've already done Saturday morning science. Yeah. Done, 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 done
<coughs> and it was under under good, 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 I think. Under good. Thank you. Well, it wasn't advertised well enough. No. Okay, well, we need, maybe we want to consider ways of vitalizing so, something we already have available. And I'll tell you, you know, I, okay, um, one of the most, I'm a, I think most people know I'm a national public radio fan. And one of the most fascinating sessions on NPR, there's a program called uh, Ira Flato and Friday, Science Friday. And he had Don Pettit on supposedly for 10 minutes one Friday. And an hour later, uh, after having canceled everything that was supposed to be on his show, you know, they went off the air and Don Pettit had mesmerized people on the radio uh, talking about science in space and p creating picture images of his space cup, you know, the coffee cup and all kinds of stuff. So um, we have done it and we know how to do it. We just need to, uh, uh, you know, Ellen, Helen, as you said, we need to make sure that we advertise it better. We, we don't advertise very well. Or fly Don on longer missions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or you could fly me. <laughs> well, Barbara Morgan, and, and, and I think she, there's an individual bias. She, she believes there should be an educator on all ISS flights, and if there can't be an educator on the flight, maybe we can do something uh, with, with the astronauts and, 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 and prepare them. They're well prepared to do simple things. They know how to do these simple scientific experiments, but actually prepare them to become ed better educators in the, the area of inquiry-based science. So we can talk about, well, we don't know the answer to this and here's what we're doing. In fact, they were even suggesting that the astronauts could become docents and explain the functionings of well, everything that's going on at ISS and this is the this is how the toilet works, this is how the oxygen exchange thing works, this is how this works, this is how that works. And they, they think that that could be an interesting uh, 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 demonstration and, uh, for uh, children worldwide. Please. I have a, a comment. Uh, to me, there, there are two different aspects of education and outreach, and I wonder if you've discussed it at all. One is doing a better job of reaching out and getting information, as you've discussed, whether it's through the iPhone or other means, but just getting it out to the, to the broad uh, youngsters, K-16 or whatever. And I think we, we can clearly do more of that. The other part that I thought that I think that NASA does a fantastic job already, if, if you look at the first robotic competition, <clears throat> the first robotic <clears throat> excuse me, competition has already been going on for years. It's international. It reaches out to high schools. I'm sure in, in every neighborhood there are high schools that, that go through local, regional competitions and then make their way to Atlanta or wherever the final competition is every other I mean every year. It is so successful. It's a hands on competition. Everybody uh, prepares for it. They wait for the kit to come out January, whatever, first week of January, and they're off running for 10 weeks or so uh, in the competition. I think it's such a huge success. I know my kids are excited about it and so on. We should find more examples that are, that are supported, uh, like the first competition, that provides hands-on um, work for high schools, maybe youngsters, even, you know, youngers, uh, uh, through Legos or whatever, but something that maybe ties it to the space station, uh, but reach, it's different than just giving information and letting them get informed. It's putting them to work. <laughs> Charlie? If I can just... I think, I think that is an incredible example of what we need to do. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. There are an incredible number of very successful educational programs out there. My experience is becoming uh, that we are criticized, believe it or not, when we try to enter the educational field. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, how to deal with that, but that's, that's okay. Uh, what we do is we provide content. Uh, when you talk about FIRST Robotics, we have three. I didn't know this until I went to the international championships in Atlanta. Uh, we have we sponsor 312 teams around the country, around the world. There is no other uh, agency, no other uh, industry organization that does that. And it's just NASA engineers and scientists and contractors who mentor kids. Uh, that is effective uh, involvement in education. 
uh, first robotics, first Legos, all these other things, uh, we're looking at working with the Creative Coalition. It's an organization out of New York that, func that, that focuses on the arts. But they feel that NASA, uh, going back to what Koichi said yesterday, I think, um, not here, but about, you know, Japan being more culturally oriented and doing uh, poetry and stuff like that on station. I, I think, you know, having talked to the folk from, from the Creative Coalition, uh, that is a rich opportunity for us to reach out from station and let them utilize station to do what they know how to do very, very well. We just facilitate their success. So I, I think most of you know I'm, I'm very, I'm really aggressive at doing educational stuff, but I'm also learning that maybe we ought to just be the facilitator, you know, and step back and let the educators work through us. Uh, sort of like I pray sometime, you know, uh, speak through me or do something through me. And, and I, think, I think we'll be much more effective. So. The, 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 um, the Marcelo had, but, but Charlie, if I might just comment on that, our group did talk at, at, uh, at length about that. We picked up on the comments that were made yesterday about uh, broadening our inter interdisciplinary focus just beyond engineering and biology and physics and mathematics and in, in coming into the arts. I, I could imagine that if you were to call somebody in Washington who deals with the humanities and, and arts, they may not take your phone call because they wouldn't believe that, the, that somebody from NASA is actually interested in uh, figuring out ways of uh, creating partnerships. But it would be if in an all primary education worldwide, it's essentially for the first six years, it's primarily mathematics and reading. And so if we can figure out a way of you know, you know, hitting those hard with really good curricula and good activities, we, we probably make some headway. So it, Marcelo, please. Uh, just two comments. One is the ISS, as I mentioned, as an analog, and I think I want to reiterate the potential, or no, not potential, I think is the value of analogs in the education and outreach, and I think NEMO has been an example of that, and Devon Island in a certain degree. But I think the analog could be a useful tool in this, this mission of education and outreach. The other comment I want to make is there's a lot of focus on, on youngsters' early stages in education. There is a, a, a population of scientists, engineers, that maybe we can capture for that. There, I'm used to work in the summer school and the NASA Space Radiation Summer School, in which part of the students are scientists from other, uh, uh, other disciplines that are being attracted for the space radiation and become part of the community. So there's a, also a other population that need to be uh, put attention on, on that and recruited for the space program and interest. Good. Well, we, we uh, excellent comments. So we we actually don't know the magnitude that which space life sciences or space medicine is taught in three thousand universities in this country. There's not been a study. We don't. We know it's focused on primarily some of the top tier schools. MIT, for one, has been a leader in this country, as well as uh, now at Texas A&M and others. But it's a uh, it's something that's really uh, vacant in the curriculum. And so it's, is there opportunities to engage university faculty members as well as under, uh, high school teachers in the activities that we're doing? It's it, uh, and, but not only explaining what it is we do, but giving them something they can take back to their respective classrooms and plug it into whatever it is that they do. So, Helen. Thank you very much. That's great ideas. Um, I got moved from education to analogs this year, so uh, we're both are wonderful. Um, the, Charlie brought this up yesterday. You know, we have the space grants, and uh, I can only speak for a few, and I know Barbara's been involved in the Idaho, but they have different focuses, and the one in Texas is, is focused on t teacher training. And exactly, and I go to their annual meetings, and they have... The teachers actually have some very innovative ideas, and most of them are web-based. And I don't know if there's a stronger way of supporting them in this. I know their budgets have been increased, but, you know, they really do um, have an opportunity to deal with the whole state. And I think that's been really a wonderful program. It's just that they're very limited in their own resources. And, um, but there's just a huge potential there to work with K through 12. And they do focus a lot on, on uh, middle school teachers 
and try to bring them the curriculum. And, and education at NASA does have a lot of curriculum. It has a lot of content. It just uh, We just have to be more aggressive, I guess, in getting it out there. I've certainly gone out and, and promoted it, and the teachers are always just thrilled to have it. The other um, aspect of this is that I mean, we do do at downloads where NASA dots do talk to kids, and there's a big program that goes on now. So maybe it's just that you guys don't know about it, and that's maybe a continuing problem because for uh, the time, I don't know, since the 80s, astronauts have been talking to students from orbit and from ver using very different, various different mechanisms. And so they've done that uh, very well, and it's been very exciting. And some of the programs, uh, Starshine was a program with probably had 20 countries and 100,000 students involved. So they're, they're out there. It's just I don't know how to, to bring them so that you all that are involved in the education know more about it. Maybe we should have a workshop on NASA's education so we could bring everybody in and get them educated. I don't know, I don't know how to, to take the resources that we do have and get it out there. And there is a lot of web material, and it could easily be, given the right folks doing it, be converted to an app and get uh, real-time information, because it's all out there. It's just not getting focused the right way. Bill, I, I want to just relate a, a kind of a personal anecdote uh, having to do with the Butterflies in Space project. because uh, to, And just to sort of tag on to what Leon was talking about with the hands-on piece, uh, because sometimes, even though it's anecdotal, I think it sort of brings home what's important. And that is... Um, I visited with you all uh, before the project. You had the cat, some of the caterpillars. Greg Vogt had them, and he was very kind and gave me some. And I took them home to my 12-year-old who d did the project as it was being done on the shuttle. And, of course, he was surprised and delighted like a lot of 12-year-olds. That's not so surprising. But what I also did, I think, to the sort of uh, dismay of some of my colleagues was we were having a, a, a human research program uh, management tag up at JSC, stuck some in my pocket, in the container. And as I was talking about educational uh, and outreach efforts for NSBRI during the tag up, pulled them out and passed them around. This was four o'clock on a Friday afternoon and the surprise and the delight of my colleagues in HRP was in fact not different from my 12 year old. So I want to tell everybody that it, there's just as much excitement out there uh, among our colleagues still. And, and I will add also that the only time I've ever been treated like a rock star in my life was by 92 seventh graders at the Fort Bend ISD Gifted Academy here in the Houston area. And Charlie, many of those kids actually wanted to be astronauts. I asked them, so. Thank you, Dave. But I, I, uh, yesterday when I made my comment about the, uh, uh, the losing of the, uh, of the orb spider, I didn't realize that Mike Fink was the mission <laughs> specialist, and, they, and I, that caught me a little off guard. I'm glad he affirmed my story that, uh, the, that he couldn't find the other spider, and, uh, it, uh, but uh, what really was more, uh, uh, actually made me feel really proud was the fact that one day the, sp uh, the, the spider couldn't weave the web, and the next day the spider did weave the web, and the impact that it made on, on uh, somebody who's uh, one of our superstars of, um, uh, for flight. So, please. Um, Bill, if I can, one of the interesting things here is, uh, I think, is what Christian spoke of, which is outputs of what this conference has done. And what's interesting is we have an opportunity here to actually do an analog on the analogs, on the academic programs. Marcella brought up an interesting point about opening up and capturing the young scientists. Um, in the UK, and I'm sure here in the US, I'm lucky enough to be over in the UK, that the funding councils over there, the academic funding councils, the medical, the biological, and the engineering, um, when you submit a grant, there are overheads, and those overheads are for funding the operations, basically keeping things ticked over. If we could tap into these funding councils, tied into the analogs, excite the young scientists and have their proposals for using these analogs go in, there's funding available to keep these analogs running, but also have the pull through of these young academics into having these mentors like Christian, like Dave, and, and the others that are using these analogs to push through the young scientists that we don't have. And unfortunately, I don't think we do a very good job of tying this in very well. Um, morning. I'm sorry that I haven't been here for the last couple of days, and I'm sorry if you've covered this point already. Um, I'm glad Jim feels 
lucky to be in the UK as, as, as a lover of human spaceflight. I don't always feel very lucky to be in the UK. Um, I I'm, w want to take on this point about funding and about education. And I know there's a recognition we need to do things better, but I wonder what effort is expended in trying to parameterize how valuable space is, and human spaceflight in particular, to the educational effort. Because we say these things, but I have been involved in about five reviews in the UK at government level where we've had great difficulty in finding objective hard evidence that suggests that investing in these programs has benefits, educational benefits. Uh, and certainly for me in the UK, it's essential for us to be able to make that argument. And I assume in this age of austerity, it's going to be important for other countries as well. Okay. And that's one of, it's an excellent comment. It's, if I might, it's a, the same problem and the same challenge that agencies such as NASA have is they, they, the, the, the documentation and the documentation and the evaluation and real data suggesting the impacts of a lot of things that have been funded over time is a, uh, have, have not been available. In, in U.S., if you give a dollar the, the, to a, an educational activity, what is the impact on the real metric? And the metric, the real metric is student achievement. And can you document that? So it's beyond behavioral change of a teacher. That's content knowledge, and the teacher's going to change the pedagogical behaviors in a classroom. What did you do to improve the test score of that student who learned whatever it was you were teaching? Jim? If I can add to that, Kevin, I think one of the things that we're learning in the UK is the and it, I think NASA is a perfect example, is multidisciplinarity. And one of the things that we are, we're a bit of a closed community in a lot of ways, uh, for many reasons, national and international uh, reasons. I think that if we can understand how to translate, not only like you, you said, Bill, with the, the technology speak, but translate the benefit, because we know the benefit, but the wider community doesn't realize the benefit. We're not able to communicate that benefit outward to be able to excite the young teachers, to be able to see why what we're doing impacts the life on Earth. And if we're not doing that, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. Thank you. Yes, yes, we all, when we attend these conferences, we always pick up that one line that we're going to weave into our speeches and our talks and our, our, our regular, uh, our daily lives. And yet Joan made that comment yesterday. We've all heard the thing about herding cats, and that they, but her wonderful metaphor was move the food. And actually, a, a research administrator on our educational group uh, made the suggestion that maybe there should be an educational tag associated with all research projects. And NASA JSC, is a, the Human Research Program, is requiring an educational activity associated with all educational research projects that they're going to be funding. It's not just a matter of I'm going to put $15,000 on top of a graduate student. It's actually that they're going to do something in education to make, to make sure that what's being done in the research laboratory is translated and transferred into classrooms and, and uh, at the university level and the K-12 level. Good. So that is essentially, if I might wrap up, uh, our report. And uh, I'll... Uh, mention. Uh, I think that's really about everything that we, we have to do. It was a, uh, uh, I have all my notes and uh, we'll certainly communicate that to your staff. And um, if there are not any other questions, thanks so much.
Well, of course, that, that was the, uh, the big problem with all the things we had discussed is how do you implement this kind of thing? Uh, governing body, you know, the, the likeliest way to do it was the way that Chiaki suggested is to expand the, um, the uh, International Space Life Sciences Working Group and, and of course, including our, include our Russian colleagues in that. That's the most glaring omission that uh, has been a part of all this. But then maybe naturally it would evolve out of that. Of course, there would have to be a lead organization that would take charge of that and would need to convince all the other other interested parties, all the other agencies, uh, and it would, it would probably take, um, uh, you know, people pretty much close to the top, Charlie and his counterparts, to really want to do this and then uh, figure out the right structure to do it. Um, you know, we were certainly, nobody really had, like, the, the silver bullet of how to do that, uh, but if the, the broader group has ideas, uh, it would probably be, you know, we've got some time now to discuss it. So, if we have micro, get the microphones in here. Oops, uh, oh. Is this turned on? Yeah, it is now. Okay. Wanted to give a little a little more detail uh, than Charlie had time to give about 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 our deliberations, uh, which will which will highlight some of the some of the things we need to do. Uh, we 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 tried to describe a uh, a a collaborative approach to a dedicated expedition for life sciences on the space station. Not not to recommend one; it's way premature to do that. But to dis, to tease out what the advantages and disadvantages of it were. The advantages of it are fairly obvious. Uh, if you if you start with a description of the objectives of such an expedition at an international level, which would describe this board that that we're talking about, to Let's say we decided to do an expedition on countermeasures. You'd lay out what the countermeasures were that you could approach, how you would approach them. You'd have to down-select methods of exercise, for example, lest you get conflict. But it has all kinds of advantages because you're coordinating the science, the hardware, the crew, and all the other uh, uh, things you need into one effort. However, <laughs> there were a lot of difficulties, a lot of problems in executing that approach that came out of the discussion. And this is the, the, the list of action items that we're going to have to tackle at both high levels within our agencies and down to the working levels. And just a, a few examples, crew selection and training currently leaves very little time for science training. And part of that is, is related to just how we do it today. Part of it is related to the fact that we must launch on Soyuz. And that was described to us in detail. But the bottom line is that if, if we're talking about a six crew member a, a expedition, four of them have to be Soyuz trained. Uh, the other two can be passengers on Soyuz, but, but, but not have crew member details. And so uh, crew selection and training is a big problem and one that we have to overcome. ITAR, you talked about. Uh, Joe, are you talking about selecting them earlier or what? Yeah, this is this kind of what we were talking about using the, the uh, Space Lab model. So you would select the payload crew earlier. Uh, I'll let you chime yeah, in. Yeah, very Jim, important but to select yeah. the crew at, the, at about the time that you select the experiments. And I didn't get into that, but once, once, once you have uh, uh, outlined the objectives, uh, that's when you go out with your, uh, with your uh, request for proposals and, uh, and, and select peer-reviewed experiments that meet those objectives. And, and about the time that those experiments are selected for flight, that's when you want the crew to come in because you want the crew to be co-investigators, if possible, on these experiments, okay? So that all has to be pulled together, and it's going to take time to do it. Uh, yeah, and, have, and just to just to uh, just to talk about that for a second, Chiaki, Don, and I, all all three of us, flew together on our first flight on IML2, the Second International Microgravity Lab, and that's exactly what happened. The payload crew got assigned early. We went to the international working groups. We met the investigators, and I mean the experiments already had already been selected. So, Joe, I think you're talking about uh, coming in even a little bit earlier. But by and large, it was all peer reviewed, and it was that community that selected the experiments that were going to fly on that space lab. We have the uh, the uh, percentages of effort and uh, and funding by the various international partners that has to be worked through. Uh, we have hardware deficiencies that we'll undoubtedly have. We'll have we have up and down mass limitations, and a whole so host I, of other things. It's I think the model is the space lab. the The way we did space lab crew selection and training, and that it, it worked incredibly well. Exactly. 
So anyway, all that stuff needs to be worked, and we need to write that down and go figure out how to do it. Right, and that's why the ISLS working group would be a logical extension of what you know, the IWG was to each individual uh, space lab mission. And can, can I add one more thing about um, not exactly what you're talking about, but the discussion yesterday was about trying to find some way to um, select experiments. Um, one of the things that we're going to experiment with in the in the U.S. lab, U.S. module only, is to hire a non-governmental organization similar to Space Telescope Science Institute, you know, that will be the clearinghouse for experiments in the in the U.S. module. If it works, then Gerst's idea is that, you know, we then have something that we can take to the international community and we can say, hey, this worked for us for a period of time. Would you like to expand it to the entire international laboratory as opposed to just the, the U.S. national laboratory, whatever it is? So that's something coming down the, down the road. No, that's great. I, I, had, I didn't know about that, and I don't think any of us yesterday really uh, knew about that. Otherwise, we certainly would have talked about it. But that sounds like the ideal framework to try out first domestically and then expand internationally. And maybe that can blend in together with the ISLS working group, and it can kind of merge into that whole organization. Yeah, it's, it's a... That'll be in the U.S. lab? I think. But I'm, it won't I'm be doing, life science. It'll be all the science. I think it's all science. Yeah, it'll be all science. It makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it... It, definitively. It's, Mr. Of course, most of it's, life. it's a great way to go, Charlie, but it's different than the way I described because we need to do both in life sciences. We, we need to have an international facility and, and to which experiments are selected this way and they flow up. But if you need a highly coordinated approach to problem solving, then you need to go a different way. And all I was saying was it, it does not – it is – it's um, – it's co conducive to what you want to do. It's the way that we determine what... It's the way we think we determine what the experiments are going to be. It's the very first step, and it gets NASA out of the, you know, out of the, the, the responsibility, and it gets us away from what used to be when I first became an astronaut of being accused of having junk science because it is an independent organization uh, of experts in all fields who, you know, they do it, for pay, yeah, or something. I don't it's know. all peer reviewed. Yeah. yeah. You know, one of the other things that uh, that we talked a little bit about uh, was down mass and whether that should be something that would factor in. Uh, of course, the the world that we're living in today or about to evolve into is that there's really going to be little or no down mass, and uh, everybody's been gearing their research to that uh, to that reality. And the question became: Should we develop a, a a down mass capability, not necessarily a big down mass capability, but what about uh, Kaz had an idea, why don't we uh, develop a, you know, and this is something that's been kicked around, I think, in Japan, uh, develop some sample return capability, just a small reentry vehicles that could come down fairly often. And that would allow you to keep the uh, pace of the experiments on board, keep them synchronized with their counterpart experiments on the ground. And uh, that was an idea that kind of some people thought, well, you know, as we go farther out into space and into uh, beyond LEO uh, missions, then our research is going to be more and more dependent on, you know, just having digital data coming back rather than sample return. So there were kind of two camps, but it was an interesting thought, an interesting discussion on whether or not we ought to try to develop some kind of sample return, down mass, small down mass capability, frequent return for ISS. I have a question, and uh, maybe it's more related to Charlie than to you. Uh, talking about the governing body uh, you, uh, you're describing, the ISS program, and I spent this several years, uh, when you talk the, uh, about the international community, the ISS program office actually has this capability, but it worked the last 10 years in the building the station. Now it's a utilization phase, and one of the ideas would be to enhance ISS program office could be, you know, just uh, oriented more to science because we mostly have engineers and operations. And if you enhance it and uh, introduce there more science, maybe it, it, it could work because it already has all the connections with the international communities. The Russian Space Agency, for example, RSC Energia, and IBMP as well. Uh, yeah, and I, I can't answer entirely. You know, Gerst, again, would be the person that could give you the definitive answer, but the way that I've been briefed, they, they intend to try to do that 
when we talk about COTS, the commercial, you know, the, taking cargo to orbit, um, when we were talking about trying to stand up a new program office for commercial crew, that's different than cargo. And we were saying that why should we mess with something that has been so successful for 10 years, which is the, the cargo uh, sub office inside the International Space Station office, where they know all the coordination required across the different uh, national boundaries and international law and all that stuff. And so what we have done right now is we've left the COTS, the cargo office, in the International Space Station office. So, you know, we're not, we're not taking that out and making it anything new, at least not, not right now, so, because it works. And also, you just can add some people in the ISS program office, basically, you know, experience in science. Uh, did you uh, look at also the governing body looking at sharing facilities on the station? Well, that was the other question was, well, if we form this governing body, who's going to pay for it and uh, how would it be allocated? Would it be kind of like the ESA model where, you know, different countries put in different amounts and then you get corresponding uh, percentage of influence or, or uh, you know, uh, access to resources? Um, that was something we discussed, but we didn't really come up with um, – with an answer. I mean, that seemed like a logical way to start. Uh, and again, this ISLSWG um, seemed like the right, you know, structure to start with and then evolve it from there. But we didn't get into the specific mechanics of how that would work and, and what it would uh, eventually evolve into. Does this, uh, would this governing body also look at priorities for exploration? Uh, well, it was it was really geared towards ISS, what we're talking, but there's no reason it couldn't be geared towards research as we go out on exploration missions. Uh, I don't know how much, you know, I don't think anyone knows how much research is going to be involved in the exploration missions. Probably in the early on, there may not be uh, much research at all. But No, no, I mean priorities that would be based on exploration. Oh, you mean, oh, okay, based the science based on uh, uh, exploration objectives. That would certainly be logical, uh, you know, and, but the big thing we wanted was peer-reviewed science. And so, of course, the, the governing body would set the priorities, the thrust areas, if you, were, if you will, uh, of what, you know, we, what that governing body you know, as an international group felt was important. And that would, I think, would be logically we'd be aligned with exploration goals, assuming we're going to be doing international exploration. So absolutely, yes. Did you look at expanding uh, the, the governing body beyond the existing partners? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, it was talked about that any, you know, anybody that would be involved in exploration would certainly, you know, because we've talked about in the Augustine report, we talked about the importance of the international framework. In fact, one of our findings was that the, the most important thing that came out of the, has come out of the ISS program is this international framework that has worked remarkably well. And so we said that that framework ought to be bolstered and expanded, and that would apply, too, for uh, this governing body, I would assume, and, you know, and for exploration. Have you got all this written up in your notes? It's all in my notes. I can uh, I can give you a write up and. Uh, no, I think it'd be beneficial to have it uh, all that written up. You bet. It's all handwritten now, but I'll type it up. Leroy, did you discuss an option having a Soyuz, unmanned Soyuz as a you know a mass down? Uh, we didn't because the the discussion on the down mass was more uh, what kind of novel, uh, perhaps inexpensive, dare we say, uh, and frequent return that we could use, you know, for for experiments. I mean, Soyuz would carry a lot more, but it would come down less frequently. It carries two hundred. Sure. Right. Right. Would this uh, governing body uh, get into? Uh uh, analogs such as uh, the 500-day study and uh, presumably that would all filter through the peer review process. So would, you know the the group that does the peer review would come up you know would know would know about the existing research both uh, in flight as well as on the ground. And so presumably that would all filter through and and come through that body and it would all be incorporated. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, I've spent about the last 20 years in the training area at Johnson Space Center, and I've also been in ISS Capcom since Increment 5, so uh, I get to hear a lot of debriefs about the training in general. But in particular, the debrief comments we get very routinely are that we are getting way too much time for payload training. And the reason is because the 
payload activity on the crew is is pretty simple. I mean, it's you know they're an operator of payloads primarily, not a scientist, as we heard some discussion on yesterday. And so I think fundamentally, it's not a question of assigning the crew earlier so they can get more time to train. If anything, their complaint is they're getting too much time training something that's fairly simple for them. But rather, do we want to reorient the way we do this so that they really are researchers with you know, a, a co-equal part in how the experiment's designed because they can see so well what's going on. You know, Charlie mentioned Don Pettit. I was, I remember very vividly those days when Don Pettit was on board and the Saturday science he would send down and I would get copies of that and show it to my group every week because it was just so fascinating. And it was, you know, he was the right guy, obviously, right, but he right. was in, he was, he's in the minority. Able, yeah. <laughs> he was able to just take that unique perch he had right. and, and be a real participant and, and make it something that people could relate to very well. And, you know, so I think fundamentally the question is, do we want to orient it so that our astronauts are really collaborative researchers on board in this world-class facility we have? Right. Or do we want to use them as operators of somebody else's science remotely? Well, Today it's really more the latter sure. than the former. Right. And that's, that's the paradigm shift we were talking about and going more to a space lab uh, kind of a model and even beyond that because the, the astronauts that would be assigned early would be science specialists you know, that would have the background to be able to actually be almost a co-I you know, on these experiments and they would be involved very early on. And so it's actually taking a step beyond what we did for space lab. So you wouldn't take, MSs wouldn't be interchangeable anymore. You'd have sp very specific people that you would assign to very specific missions for those science objectives. So that's the, that's the biggest part of the paradigm shift I think we were talking about. And if we really wanted to go out and, and maximize science, that would probably be the way to do it. Of course, there are other, other requirements and other objectives of the station too. So we're being fairly parochial when we talk about it from this perspective. Lear, I, I'd like to just echo that point based on uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the, the NAC sponsored a lunar biomedical workshop in Houston and uh, that consisted of a mix of investigators, uh, program managers, and uh, astronauts. And that same conclusion that you just described uh, was, was arrived at independently there with a quite a different group of people than are sitting here today, all with the same kinds of interests, but exactly that, reinforcing the idea of, uh, of the crew members as uh, co-investigators was something that crews supported, and uh, at least in that, in, in that discussion, as, as well as investigators. Well, and, and at the risk of uh, opening a, a can of worms, you know, that, that's kind of the push and pull that has gone on as the astronaut office has evolved. As, as you all know, the astronaut office started years ago as a bunch of fighter pilots, you know, and we evolved into uh, the shuttle era, and we've got some, uh, uh, now we've got scientists and engineers involved. And so as that evolution continues, uh, I think you'll see more of a push for what you're talking about, being more co-eyes involved in some of the research as opposed to uh, more of the pilot mentality, just tell me what I need to know and which buttons to push when. I have decided. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you're a Renaissance pilot, especially for a Marine guy. <laughs> <laughs> Лерой, можно сделать замечание небольшое? Лерой, uh, can I please make a comment? The problems that were raised uh, by the first group are very relevant. And uh, it's great that there is a worldwide concern. And uh, I admire the attention that Charles Bowden is showing to this particular venue. Um, I imagine that the creation of the International uh, Scientific Council 
um, in order to make uh, ISS some international laboratory similar to the human genome or collider, super collider is a great uh, uh, is a great Z, and I think we should be moving in that direction. But it also seems to me that if we are going to choose that method as a, a international laboratory, then uh, what will be required is specification or clarification of the international agreement, uh, not a rework of uh, ISS agreement, but uh, clarification or update because certain scientific issues were um, written there in a more generic sense and that they don't allow to include the involvement of all the uh, countries uh, jointly. So we have to think through all the legal aspects of our activity. I'll give you an example. The American and Russian group on uh, uh, space uh, life sciences uh, has been in existence, if I'm not mistaken, since 1972. And that was like deep um, in the uh, Cold War Era. And nevertheless, it has always existed and its work has been fruitful. However, uh, up till now, it's been operating at the level of, uh, institute, of the Institute um, of NASA uh, agencies, structures, but it is desirable that this group becomes uh, also with involvement of other countries, that the, such group is approved by some kind of joint uh, statement of all the agencies, uh, Canadian, Chinese, uh, Japanese, American, and in that case, once it's approved by all the, on, at the agency level, the project of the International Laboratory on the ISS will take on a more distinct outline. Um, I would also like to emphasize one more time that Russia is also concerned um, about this issue and the problem of efficiency of uh, scientific experiments uh, on ISS is uh, Anatoly Perminov's concern as well. He's your colleague and it's, it's deb in his deputies and uh, the solution could be found only jointly perhaps because there is a certain uh, um, state or a situation of uh, lack of clarity. What do we have to do next? And so to create um, or to get such an approval by the legal aspects of scientific activity in space uh, could have moved us forward much further. Thank you. Sort of a what would help me would be a letter or something out of this summit that summarizes the concern expressed there and what we've talked about this morning and yesterday so that I could take that to the next heads of agency or send it to them, you know, sort of as a preliminary for discussion at that level um, so that we could do that. That, that would be very helpful. Yeah, and I can, I can write that up as part of the notes, and I'll, I'll get that to you and uh, Dr. Alfred. Uh, thank you. Let me clarify. Thank you. Uh, I Dr. agree. Dr. Ushakov is referring to the joint working group, U.S.-Russian joint working group. Right now, it's a bilateral. Just, just for the reference, it's a JWG. So I understand, and, and it's sort of like we had to, before I left the military. We had to do this in in the Asia Pacific region. We all we all we did were bilateral things until Denny Blair became the a an interesting name. Uh, but Denny Blair became the the uh, commander of Pacific Forces for the U.S. And he was a person that felt that, you know, bilateral relationships were okay, but if we were really going to expand and become effective in the Pacific, then we needed to open it up and do more multilateral stuff. So that's what that's what I would like to do if we can. Right. No, that's 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 absolutely true, and that's what we uh, kind of hit on yesterday was that it's really going to take direction from the top of all the agencies in order for this to happen. And this just happens to be, believe it or not, what the president wants to do. So it makes it easy. <laughs> it makes it easy for me to do Good. this. It's not just one president. I think that. Oh, oh yes, <laughs> of course, uh, Konyeshna, Konyeshna. Exactly. No, you're exactly right. Yeah, especially because there is a bilateral U.S.-Russian presidential working group, and there's a work, working group on space as well, so, and those are two separate. 
Okay, looks like I've got a couple action items. Any more? <laughs> Get those notes typed up. <laughs> okay, well, thank you all very much. <laughs>